1993, Star Fox was released to considerable fanfare because of its innovative graphics and gameplay. Nintendo had managed to make use of a cartridge with an external graphics processing unit to create a game that used 3D polygons for improved graphics. The FX chip, as it was called, used an external graphics processor that would work with the system architecture of the Super Nintendo, adding to the console's overall capabilities. The FX chip impressed many in the gaming industry. And most of all, it didn't go unnoticed by Nintendo's biggest rival, at that time, Sega. For many gamers, the console war between Sega and Nintendo had been waged on a somewhat level playing field, with the Sega Genesis having a slight disadvantage in terms of graphics and color palette, but an advantage in terms of processor speed. The console wars had until that point been one of comparable performance and graphics. The FX chip gave the SNES a distinct advantage. It didn't take Sega long before they had an external GPU design of their own to compete directly with Nintendo. Even before Nintendo's chip was released in North America, Sega had begun development of their own rival chip. In late 1992, Sega began working with Samsung, Toshiba, and Hitachi to produce what Sega had coined the Super Virtua Play, or the Sega Virtual Processor. Not to be confused with Virtual, which is a common mistake, Sega filed a trademark for the SVP as the SVP Sega Virtual Processor on May 6 of 1994. The main graphics processor chip was thought to be an Hitachi SH-1 or SH-2 because of the SVP's manufacture so close to that of the 32X in Sega Saturn's development run. It was discovered that the chip is a Samsung SSP-1601. The exact nature of the deal between Samsung and Sega is unknown currently. Thankfully, the emulator community discovered that the SVP was not an Hitachi chip, which has helped illuminate more into the history of the SVP. Based on information found within the Japanese patent office, Sega approached Hitachi with the design specs for the SVP cartridge, and Hitachi helped design the control system between the SVP graphics chip and the Toshiba microprocessor on the cartridge board. They filed a patent about this in July of 1992. Around this time, a number of Sega's hardware design engineers actually worked openly with Toshiba and Hitachi, and even going as far as having their names on the inventor credits of Sega, Toshiba, and Hitachi patents. Once the control system had been mapped out with Hitachi's assistance, Sega engineer Yutaka Okunoki finalized the design of the SVP cartridge and filed for a design patent in October of 1993. The finalized cartridge was quite a bit more powerful than that of Nintendo's touted FX chip. The SVP chip had a Samsung SSP-1601 DSP chip, with an internal clock speed of around 23 MHz, with the ability to do 25 MIPS, ROM of about 1K instructional, RAM, 2048 bytes, with memory of about 2 kilobytes, internal data bus of 16 bytes, external data bus of 16 bytes, and the ability to do about 300 to 500 polygons per second, with a choice of about 16 colors. The SVP also offered additional power for polygon generation. 60,000 polygons per second for geometry transformations, 50,000 for lighting calculations. For 3D polygon rendering, it offered 20,000 polygons per second for flat shading, and 10,000 polygons per second for other functions, as well as 9,000 per second is what the average Virtual Racer game could put out, and texture mapping up to 3,000. However, something that is to be considered as a major drawback of the SVP is that the Sega Genesis draw palette limits what the SVP can do only to generating about 16 colors per second, which can hinder design choices in a game. All that aside, though, the Sega SVP offered a formidable opponent to Nintendo's FX chip. Virtual Racing was selected to be the pioneer title for the SVP. When Virtual Racing was released, it had considerable fanfare from many magazines touting the SVP's technical prowess, but the game's steep launch price point of $100 made it a bit more of an expensive oddity. Virtual Racing was the most expensive cartridge Sega had ever produced, what is perhaps the most interesting thing about the SVP is that it's relegated to a footnote in the history of Sega. Despite what the SVP did for the Genesis, it was overshadowed by its more powerful Sega console soon to be released, most notably the 32X, which was drastically more powerful and offered a superior version of virtual racing later. The SVP was a step forward in graphical ability, but not the generational leap that the Saturn offered, nor the considerable improvement in graphical resources offered by the 32X. The only SVP game released, Virtual Racing, was never meant to be the end of the SVP chip. The $100 price point, although high, was only about $40 more expensive than Nintendo's FX chip titles, which retailed for around $59.99. That $40 difference was big enough incentive for Sega to have a plan for decreasing costs for future SVP releases. Virtual Racing as we know it 
was a proof of concept for the SVP chip. Sega had plans to release the SVP as a standalone cartridge, which would be modular to game carts designed for it. We know this because Sega mentioned this to Electronic Gaming Monthly and GamePro before Virtual Racing was released. Sega's plan was that they were going to release an SVP standalone cart that was just the SVP graphics chip for roughly $49.99, and then have game carts that worked with it that would retail for around $39.99 apiece, making future SVP titles extremely competitive with Nintendo's FX titles. Sega actually had more games ready to come out with the SVP modular design. Joe Miller Sega of America's Senior VP of Product Development actually states in an interview with Sega16.com about the things the SVP actually had in the pipeline. The formation of SegaSoft was a much bigger discussion than just a rebrand of STI. It had to do with the company looking at all kinds of things associated with the fact that we were supporting numerous platforms within our development organizations. The SOA product development team, including STI, was not very large, but we were still supporting 9 or 10 platforms in 95. We also had adaptations of other hardware to support. We had the SVP chip. We had experimented with different cartridge models like the lock-on cart and some other hardware. What we did do with the SVP chip, which I don't think a lot of people realize, is that we had a fully working level of Virtua Fighter running on that chip. That never shipped, and it ended up being saved for Saturn, obviously. It was done about the same time, and instead of shipping it on the SVP after Virtua Racing, the decision was made to just port it straight over to the 32X. The 32X was capable of a much higher poly count, and it felt very much like the coin-op. Joe Miller, 2013, Sega16.com The SVP had at least three titles ready or in late-stage production, made by Sega Arcade Studio AM2. AM2 had created a version of Virtual Fighter, Daytona USA, and even Star Wars Arcade was rumored to be in the production pipeline for the SVP. However, Sega had stated that the SVP ports were scrapped, because they didn't want to take away from the 32X and Saturn systems that were on the horizon. This can also be somewhat attributed to that the Genesis never was successful in Japan as it was in the United States, and Sega of Japan didn't have as much interest in another device that supported the ailing Genesis. But ultimately, Sega made the decision to not move forward to the SVP standalone unit, and let Virtual Racing remain as the only SVP game released for the Genesis. The most commonly written reason for Sega not following through with the SVP was because the cartridge was too expensive to produce. This idea can be backed by the fact that Sega just didn't have the resources of its rival Nintendo, and on top of that, Sega was rolling out more console platforms to support, and yet another Genesis add-on may have not appeared viable to Sega. I, however, have a different theory. While researching the SVP, I found something in the U.S. Patent Office. In 1994, Codemasters, the company that made the Game Genie, filed a patent. This patent was for a device that would use a graphical processor standalone cartridge that would allow for separate game cartridges to be plugged into the GPU standalone cartridge and generate 3D graphics on a 16-bit system. Sega filed a trademark that same year, but never filed the patent for the SVP standalone unit. Sega of Japan filed patents for the graphical control system, but never moved past that stage. In comparison, the Codemaster design is identical to the SVP standalone concept. Codemasters filed their patent the same year Sega announced the SVP standalone unit to media outlets. Sega's decision to abandon the SVP may not have been exclusively because of expensive production costs, and Sega of Japan's hesitancy to release another add-on for the Genesis. It may very well could have been that Codemasters beat Sega to the patent office in the United States, and the potential legal battle would have made the SVP standalone unit a legal nightmare of litigation costs. To end it all, the Sega SVP potentially could have launched a new line of Genesis titles that could have kept the Genesis relevant for longer, but Sega chose a different path and moved forward to the 32X, which was a favorite project by Nakayama, the president of Sega of Japan. There isn't much more to be said about the SVP, I hope this video sheds a little more light on something that has been relatively overlooked in recent years. Thank you for watching the Historic Nerd today. Special thanks to Yahel from Wrestles with Gaming in doing the voice of Joe Miller for me. If you really like this content, you'll probably really enjoy his history retrospectives on different game consoles and video games. 
so I'd highly suggest going over and checking out his channel. Also, if you like this content, feel free to go to theconsoleexplosion.com, which has a number of content creators over there that do fantastic work. But thanks for dropping by. If you like The Historic Nerd, feel free to drop by my website, www.historicnerd.com, or if you want to bug me directly, feel free to contact me at historicalnerd on twitter.com. So, hope you have a wonderful day, or whatever it is you're doing. Bye.